First that's there. Okay, so yeah, just to kind of um, give us some context here. First Isaiah is the first 39 chapters of Isaiah. Okay. Um, let's see here. And they, they mentioned, so a lot of people will say, okay, 1 through 39 is first Isaiah. Then you'll see some people say 40 through 66. Some people will even split that up between, um, I think it's 40 and 55, and then 56 to 66 mm -hmm. as being third Isaiah. And the reason they do that is because it kind of hits three major time periods. Um, and, they, and the prophecies that are contained in each of those chunks seem to address different scenarios, right? So it would be one of those, you remember how we talked about how the prophets are very much talking to a particular people in a very particular situation? Mm -hmm. The words in chapters 40 through 66 wouldn't seem to be relevant to a people in the situation of the chapters in 1 through 39. Okay, so that's kind of why scholars are going to divide them between two things, or between two um, authors or groups of authors. Right. Yeah. Can you tell me what the second Isaiah looks like? I'm sorry. Second Isaiah is typically, so if we divide it into three, 60, 60. it's 40 through 55. 55. Oh, okay. is, that, is that what? I can't remember. I yeah. read it. I think, I did so read then it. you have third Isaiah is 56 through 66. Okay. Yeah, thanks, sir. I'm pretty sure that's, that's what my memory is, is telling me anyways. Okay. Um, a quick thing, when we're looking at Isaiah, we need to kind of remember a couple things because he throws in some, some terminology, some names that we haven't really come across yet. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are Aram and Ephraim. Okay. Now Aram, Aram is sometimes synonymous with Syria. Um, a lot of times we can think of Aram as being like a region and Syria being a kingdom. Um, it, it kind of, you know, it, it's a little unclear there. But for the moment, we can kind of say Aram equals Syria. Now, Ephraim is one of the tribes of the northern kingdom located about there. But it's also where the, there are major cultic centers. Shechem and Shiloh are there. And because Shechem and Shiloh were there, because those are such central um, religious sites, Ephraim is kind of one of the stronger of the tribes. It's the predominant tribe in the north, right? So because it's the predominant tribe in the north, um, Isaiah uses Ephraim to refer to all of Israel, all of the northern kingdom. It would almost be like somebody referring to the US by means of saying New York or Washington, right? We can kind of easily say, see somebody you know, using that kind of terminology. So whenever he says, whenever Isaiah says Aram, we think, think of Syria, because we kind of know where that is, and we've dealt with Syria before, and when he says Ephraim, think of all of Israel. Okay. Yeah. Question. Is it um, Aramaic uh, language from Aram? Huh? Aramaic. Yeah, Aramaic. Yeah, it comes from that area. Exactly. Okay. Now, Isaiah is dealing, there are two major kind of political and military um, campaigns during Isaiah's time. Okay, the first of these happens in 734 BCE. And what's happening here is that Assyria is expanding. Okay, notice Assyria just kind of starts as this purple region. It's going to grow to encompass this green region. So, they are moving into this direction, okay? Now what happens as Syria and the northern kingdom, this is prior to them falling, right? Prior to Israel falling, Syria and Israel see this advance and they form an alliance, right? They say, look, we're not going to be able to defeat Assyria with just our individual forces but if we combine forces against Assyria, we, we might have a chance. 
right? But they also want Judah to get in on this fight too. Okay, they're like, look, we need we need this lower, the southern kingdom to help us out as well. Judah won't do it. Wait, I'm sorry. Who are mm -hmm. the two that you said came together? Syria and Israel. Oh, okay, because I was thinking north and south, even though I was listening to what you said. Yeah. <laughs> Syria and Israel come together. They form an alliance. Okay. Try to get Judah to do it. Judah won't won't go. They mm -hmm. won't budge. Right. So what Syria and Israel do is they try to force Judah's hand. They lay siege to Jerusalem. Right. They lay siege to the capital. They think if we can overthrow Jerusalem, Jerusalem, then we can then enlist all the men from the southern kingdom to help us fight. Somehow, um, Judah withstands. And the way they do it is Judah gets a serious help. <laughs> right? So Judah's like, no, you guys are trying to form us. We're going to get these big bad guys to come against you all. So Judah withstands, but what that means then is that they now have to answer to Assyria, mm -hmm. right? It's almost like saying to the bully, hey, there's these other like little bullies picking on me. Can you beat them up and I'll just give you my lunch money every day, <laughs> right? <laughs> this, is, this is pretty much um, kind of what goes down. So Judah becomes a vassal to Assyria, right? And we obviously know that Israel doesn't stand, mm -hmm. right? When, when did they fall? Seven. Seven. 22. 22. 722, exactly. So they fall. Now, Assyria is really, really expanding now, right? And as Assyria is expanding, what do you think kind of happens to their military might? Well, it's going to grow. It's going to increase bigger. Huh? It's going to increase. It's going to spread out, so it's like in areas. Yeah. Well, that's true. It's going to be bigger, but it's because he's spread because they're spreading out, their military might actually decreases. There's a whole lot more land that they're having to defend, right? If you've got forces going here and here and here and conquering these people, right, your military forces are going to get thinner. And so Assyria starts to weaken a little bit. And when Assyria starts to weaken, King Hezekiah down here in Judah starts to lead a rebellion against Assyria. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to have to pay this heavy tribute anymore. And he starts to rally some troops against Assyria. Well, Assyria, Assyria is still Assyria, and it doesn't last. Right? Despite Judah, who kind of not learning its lesson the first time, getting help from Egypt. So Judah's now saying, OK, we had his help from Assyria to defeat these people. But now you know, we want to get a gang of people, including Egypt to help us against Assyria, right? So there's all these kind of military alliances that are going on, and this is just what we'll see Isaiah speaking out against, is Judah's tendency to just form all these alliances because it's politically advantageous to them, right? And militarily advantageous. So, this alliance here with Egypt actually does turn out to be somewhat advantageous <coughs> in that they are able to kind of withstand Assyria's um, efforts to put down their revolt, right? So, in other words, Jerusalem doesn't completely fall here. So, they enlist Egypt's help, Assyria comes in, somehow Jerusalem stands, but again, they're still stuck paying tribute to Assyria. Right, so you've got all these kingdoms kind of coming together. There's all these borders that are shifting during this time, right? This little track of land, like we've talked about before, is constantly kind of switching hands, right? And this is the world that Isaiah is coming into and speaking into. I know that's all a little confusing, but just to kind of give you an idea of what's going on, yeah. You said that Judah enlisted Egypt's help, and Assyria still came in and tried to um, take over Jerusalem, but Jerusalem withstood. But they still, yeah. Judah still winds up paying tribute to the Assyrians. Mm -mm. Yeah. Oh, really? So yeah. So Judah, Judah's leading this revolt as because what happens in Assyria is actually the king dies, mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, here's this perfect little weakness. Mm -hmm. Let's lead a revolt. Let's get Egypt to help us lead this revolt. 
another king comes along, comes down into Judah, right? Actually conquers a lot of Judean towns, and then makes their way to the capital, right? But they make their way to the capital, and somehow Jerusalem stands, right? But pretty much the Assyrians have taken over the rest of Judah, but because the capital stands, the Assyrians retreat. <coughs> but the southern kingdom is then left paying tribute, right? Why would they not pay tribute to Egypt for helping them? Just that. <laughs> it's a good question. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not sure that they would have had, that Egypt would have been as strong. I think it's because um, the Assyrians still were having, like, having Judah pay tribute after that. That, that Egypt, I think, I think, I'm trying to remember the, um, what happened with Egypt after that, that fight. Um, well, I can't more quite like recall. for them to go ahead and leave. So we'll keep paying you if you can. Think of, you know, when the difference between the first and, and the second time, right, when Judah gets a serious help to come fight off mm -hmm. Syria and, and, uh, and Israel, is that they kind of get them to make to fight for them. The second time, Hezekiah is more just getting a group of people together saying, hey, you want to revolt? Yeah, me too. You want to revolt? Yeah, me too. So it's kind of that kind of alliance, rather than, hey, fight our wars for us. Does that make sense? So Egypt is still doing its own thing over here. They're just also trying to, like, throw off um, a serious yoke. Right? So they're all... There's just this group of, of nations that Assyria has kind of conquered or has somewhat control over, and they're all just being like, no. Like, Assyria, like, we don't have to, you know, pay these tributes. We don't have to, like, bow down to you anymore. Yeah. Now, another thing they mentioned, and this is why it's kind of important to, to know this, is that Isaiah seems to have some kind of special access to the court. We see him time and time again talking with kings. Right. And so this is why it's kind of debated, is Isaiah a court prophet? Is he employed by the royal court? He seems, it seems that he can just go up to King Hezekiah and speak to him. Right? I mean, think about how easy it is for you know, any of you to just you know, walk into President Obama's office and be like, hey, Obama, let me tell you a word of the Lord. Right? It's not just going to happen. <laughs> right? And so that's why you know, we might, we kind of, we, su we suspect that Isaiah might be employed by the royal court. Now, I want to turn to a passage, whoops, a particular passage in Isaiah that's really going to help us understand his theology. Isaiah happens to be one of the most quoted Old Testament books by Christians because of so many passages that seem to point to a Messiah. But as we have said time and time again, it's important to know what these words meant to the original audience. So this is one I want to look at, right? The sign of Emmanuel. Where is this? This is in chapter 7. Okay, verses 10 to 24. Can you write it anywhere? Uh, I can't offhand. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could make some guesses, but I'd probably be wrong. What was the chapter? Uh, chapter 7. Yeah, I just wanted to, I got to catch you. I just want to make sure. Make sure it's right. <laughs> <laughs> look, it up, look it up on BLB. You can see it there. Okay. It's a little late so, now, though. So, this is, this is during that first crisis, okay? This is during the first crisis that we talked about, where Syria and Israel are coming against Judah and trying to get Judah to fight the Assyrians with them, okay. right? And doing this forcefully. The Lord says to Isaiah, or Ahaz, sorry, who's the king of Judah at that time, asks for a sign. He doesn't do it. And so Isaiah says, here then, I'm going to give you a sign anyways. And here's the sign. Let's see here. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. Right? Here we have this kind of prophetic announcement of a name, right? So there's this 
going to be some significance to this. Emmanuel literally meaning God with us. Or God is with us. Okay. He shall eat curds. Who knows what curds are? Yeah. Yes, we'll just say like milk, butter. Exactly. And honey, by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, so by the time he knows how to make decisions on his own. Right? For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, even before this time, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. This little section is incredibly difficult to translate. If you look at this little passage in different places, you will just see so many different variations of these words. And it's really difficult just because the ordering of the words is really convoluted. Does it mean um, that the two kings coming after him will be extinguished by or not in power anymore by the time the child knows? Yeah, that seems to be the thrust of it, is that the land of those two kings is going to be destroyed. Okay? Another possible way of reading this, and don't, don't quote me on this, is that the land before those two kings, i.e. Judah, will be destroyed. It's, it's, it's hard to... The, just the construction of the sentence is incredibly strange and difficult. But it does seem to be that most translators seem to think that the verse means that the land of those two kings is going to be destroyed, deserted, right, forsaken. Okay. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on your, on your ancestral house such days as have not come since the days Ephraim departed from Judah, right? Since the days that Israel departed from Judah, right? So the days before that separation, really good, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll bring on your people such days as you haven't seen since that separation. Okay, now, here's what's interesting. This seems to be a very good promise, right? Where have we seen this before, this combination? The land of Canaan. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? This seems to be an indication of the promised land. Right? Or in a sense, Eden. Right? He will eat, he will have milk and honey. Right? This seems to be this really beautiful promise. Right? There will be a son. The son's name will be God with us. And pretty much when he is born, there will be this return to this Edenic kind of, of uh, existence, right? With eating milk and honey. And the Lord will bring such days that you haven't seen since the affirm of Jews separated. Here's where Isaiah is interesting. You remember what we looked at with uh, Amos and this shift in expectations? How he takes this thing you think is going to be great and he turns it? Yes. <laughs> Isaiah does the exact same thing. Because look how he continues. On that day, right, we're still talking about this day. And where have we come across this kind of saying before? On that day. What, what, what was this kind of thing about Amos? We talked about a special day. Yeah. They should kind of get our ears tingling. He might be talking about the day of the Lord. Remember, when you looked at Amos, that the day of the Lord, for most people, when they hear this, is going to have a positive connotation. But remember what Amos does with it. All right, flips it. The Lord will whistle for the flies, and now Amos, or sorry, Isaiah, starts going through this incredibly awful scenario. Right? The whistle for flies, the bees. This is probably not an indication of actual insects, but of armies. And they will come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and all the thorn bushes and all the pastures. Right? These armies coming in. On that day, right, this is how he starts each of these sections. He will shave with a razor, so he's going to shave you completely bald. Uh, you will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. Now get this, and will eat curds because of the abundance of milk that they give. For everyone that is left in the land shall eat curds and honey. Right? 
This is the connection here. Now listen to why they have to eat curds and honey though. Whoops. I'm gonna unfortunately have to scroll down here. On that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrow, one will go there, right? You have to go there with protecting yourself. <laughs> for all the land will be briars and thorns. And for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, or used to farm, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread, mm -hmm. right? People are eating milk and honey because there's no place to farm <laughs> anymore. The ground has been completely destroyed. Right, yeah. Now, where it says uh, briars and thorns, I mean, is that metaphorically speaking, or is, is that like representing the enemy that's going to be in the land? It's a, that's a really good question. I've always, I mean, how are we doing on time? Because, I mean, why would you okay. need to go in there with bows and arrows? Yeah. yeah. I've always wanted to teach a class on this, and this is going to kill my time, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Briars and thorns, the way it works in, um, is it ER? Yeah. The way it works in the prophetic imagination is very much how zombies work in our imagination. Okay? Because it is briars and thorns as opposed to vineyards. Vineyards represent the flourishing of creation. Briars and thorns represent things growing pretty much in the absence of God, right? Which should not be possible, right? If God withdraws his presence, what grows then is briars and thorns, right? In the same way that we think of the, uh, think of zombies as the living dead, right? The walking dead. Or maintaining a lot or something like that. Like your profession is what's you know, speaking of grass. Mm -hmm. If you back from it, it's going to be a leaf. Right. No one's going to come out and stuff like that. Exactly. If you maintain it, then you will have a lush, beautiful lawn. Exactly. So when there are, you know, think about people tending, this is their call in creation, to tend to the earth. There are no longer people to do that. Mm -hmm. So we don't have vineyards anymore. Things are just overgrown. We now have briars and thorns. Mm -hmm. So it's symbolic in a sense, but it's probably like symbolism based on actual experience. Yeah. Okay, we let this field go. Briars and thorns came up. But this is symbolic for God kind of withdrawing his presence and destroying the place. So there's no more people to plant in this, right? Where the place there used to be a thousand vines, it will become briars and thorns. Alright. This is like probably like a really big but I'm just curious. Because when you started talking about the briars and thorns and he said like the lawn workers mm -hmm. or something, that made me think of like when we were talking about Genesis. Uh -huh. And like what, you made us go on the blue letter Bible or whatever, mm -hmm. and in the like the very beginning, the first time that the word worshippers were was used to yes, sort literally meant to like be like land workers or mm -hmm. the work of land or something. Yeah. So I was just wondering if that was like a theme. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if that was like a theme like throughout the whole thing is like in like the whole land grant you're like you're here to work in this land and please me, I'll let you have X, Y, and Z, or whatever. Yeah, Is that no, very much so. And remember, you know, a lot of these covenants are based on the idea of land grant. The yeah. idea of land is its own kind of theological symbol of God's presence. Yeah, yeah that's all connected. So we kind of, you guys are making these connections because you're starting to actually get into the Hebrew mindset, right? And like seeing how these symbols make sense. Real quick, what Isaiah is working with here, and what he's alluding to, is this idea of a remnant. This is huge for Isaiah, hence Terence, right? This is a really big idea. Now, what the remnant allows Isaiah to do is hold on to the promises of God, and yet at the same time, prophecy almost complete destruction, right? This remnant who exists because God is with them will exist kind of through this destruction, but this destruction is almost complete, almost total destruction. There's even this great saying in Isaiah. This is, um, let me see here. What do I have it? Ah, in seven, wait, trying to find it. 
Oh, here it is in Isaiah 10, 19. Uh, it's, he says, the remnant of trees of his forest, right? The remnant of his people of Israel will be so few that a child can write them down. Wow. <laughs> right? There's only a few people left. So this, and we'll, I'll speak a little bit more to this idea because this is really important and I want us to kind of get a really good grasp of what Isaiah is doing with this idea of a remnant before we move on to Jeremiah because this idea is going to carry through the rest of the prophets. Now, what I wanted to kind of come back to with Isaiah is this idea of a remnant. We looked at this in the context of that passage where Isaiah promises a child will be born and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right? And we notice within that passage that this seems like a very good promise and then it kind of turns sour. Right? We start saying there will be this child, who, his name will be God with you. Um, but despite that, your land is eventually going to be taken over where you used to have all these vineyards would just be thorns and thistles, right? The way that Isaiah is talking here is very much within this concept of remnant. And he comes back again and again to this idea. And what the idea is, is that, yes, Judah will be destroyed, right? But there's going to be a small group of people that will be saved, that God will save like his, his righteous few. Right? And this is the room. And like we said at the end of class last Wednesday, it's so few, Isaiah is, is pointing out, that a child could count them on, on his hands. Now compare this to the Abrahamic promise, your you know, descendants will be so numerous that even that you know that they will number like the stars or the sands on the seashore, right? Complete flip side. Now a child could count them, presumably on his hands, right? So this is this is just how complete this destruction will be. And yet there will be a remnant, right? So this idea that, yes, you will be punished, but you're not going to be completely wiped out, right? And this is how Isaiah kind of helps the people during this time kind of cope with this situation, cope with this scenario, cope with this seeming, seemingly inevitable destruction, right? It's he allows this idea of a remnant, this way for God's promises to continue, despite what seems like a total destruction. Does that make sense? Now, the the child that he is referring to is Emmanuel. Remember we said means God with us. This could potentially refer to King Hezekiah. Okay. Um, we read even in Kings Passages where it says, and God was with him. Isaiah really likes King Hezekiah, right? Has a lot of praises for King Hezekiah, right? Hezekiah is presented in the text as doing many wonderful things, right? This could potentially refer to King Hezekiah, who comes after King Ahaz, right? So this is kind of that, that reference there, okay? So, with this idea of remnant, <coughs> Isaiah starts showing us, sort of starts kind of showing, how do I want to put this? The remnant produces, like, gives us a picture of hope for the future. With the, with the Deuteronomistic history, what we've seen is a kind of justifying how things have come before, right? Um, in the sense of, you know, think about the cycle that we saw in Judges, right? We were punished because we did wrong, right? It's kind of making sense of the past. Oh, why did we fall? Oh, it was because of King Manasseh in the past, right? Oh, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that's why we fell, right? A justifying of the past events. Why did the, why did the northern kingdom fall? Oh, King Jeroboam, right? That makes sense, right? So kind of understanding why past events have happened within this kind of theological mindset. What we start seeing with Isaiah and the prophets 
is a way to take a similar theology and have that going forward. Right? This is how God will continue his promises. Right? This is how we make sense of these future things that are coming. This is how we make sense of this seemingly inevitable destruction. Right? And we'll see this with Jeremiah. We'll see this with Ezekiel. This is how we go forward making sense of this situation. Right? And this is what a remnant does in Isaiah's thought. Right? It's a way to go forward, a way that still hold on to those promises and make sense of what's happening and also provide hope. Right? This idea of remnant provides hope. Yes, it's destruction. You know, yes, a child could count them, but there's hope in there. Right. And what we see, interestingly enough, with Isaiah is that Isaiah does have kind of this emphasis on the Davidic covenant. Because there is this idea that God will not abandon David's <coughs> lineage, right? From the stump of Jesse, a new branch will grow. Right? Jesse's stump referring to David's lineage and saying that even though this tree is cut down, a new, a new tree will emerge, right? That God's promises to David, we can still hold on to those. And we see that with, with Isaiah. Interestingly, interestingly enough, with the prophet that we're getting to today, Jeremiah, we don't see an emphasis on David. We see an emphasis on Abraham, in the Abrahamic covenant. So just kind of keeping this in mind with Isaiah. Okay? And that is going to get us to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, I don't, do you know where the... I know she's here. You know she's she here. She was in the library. So. Okay. <coughs> um, we can wait just a little for her, because she also has a, a outline for her. So she's on the slip there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, oops, losing our... Um, are there qu any questions about Isaiah as we're kind of pausing here to wait? Um, it was a verse, I guess, uh, where someone is, is sent, uh, like, uh, I can't remember, where he, he says that, uh, tell, what's that thing, Hezekiah name? I don't, okay. I don't know about, don't worry about these two stones. Um, if I think I might know what Pastor is referring to, Isaiah constantly tries to tell the kings not to form alliances, right? So Isaiah will tell, you know, one king to, hey, don't worry about Israel and Syria; they're going to be stumps. Don't form this alliance with Syria to get to get out from under this, right? Um, and then he'll later try to get the king not to form an alliance with Egypt, right? Because for Isaiah, these political alliances are kind of turning, Israel turning its back on the idea that Yahweh will take care of them, right? So to form a political alliance um, is to say, no, no, like Yahweh is not really a part of our history, not really going to take care of us. We have to do this other thing in order to be safe. And that's kind of Isaiah's kind of consistent message. So it's a very political message. Right? Don't form this alliance, or you're going to get crushed. Don't form this alliance, or you're going to get crushed. Right? And the kings obviously never listen. Right? I mean, he's right, you know, that like those two kings did become sons, right? Those those kingdoms were wiped out because of Assyria, but you know, <coughs> he did not listen. So, yeah, that's good. Um, just another kind of interesting thing. You know, we talked a little bit the other day about eschatology, right? This idea of the end. In Isaiah's message and some of his prophecies, we see kind of this returning to Eden, right? Where it's not just that Israel will be vindicated, but that all nations will come back to God, right? that this is where we have passages about the lion laying down with the lamb, right? Creatures that used to be in conflict with one another are now living peacefully amongst one another, right? So kind of just this total end to sin, right? So there's this very Edenic return in Isaiah. 
as far as his kind of eschatological vision of the future. Yeah. Um, since we're kind of like pausing, I just wonder if I could ask kind of a question that isn't necessarily related to Isaiah. Okay. Like, I'm just curious, like, here's the Hebrew people mm -hmm. out of all these other ancient texts and religions and mm -hmm. whatever going on. How, I'm just curious, like, how in the world did, like, this text and this culture and everything become so, like, prominent in our culture today? Like, how did it, you know, weasel its way through all this other stuff going on mm -hmm. and, you know, become what it is? Yeah. Well, that's a good question. That's a very good question. I think how the Jewish people survived all of this is, is bizarre in some sense, given, like, how much other just you know nationalities and, and kingdoms fell. Right. Like why that people survived. Um, God's people. This, so that's the theological explanation, right? Um, from a historical viewpoint, it's it's just it's just very interesting. And what we'll see with the prophets is just how they kind of helped Israel reshape its national identity, especially with Jeremiah. Once the people leave the land, okay, how do we still hold on to our national identity once we don't have a temple, once we don't have a land? Who are we then? How do we maintain ourselves as a people? And they start kind of reshaping that national identity to kind of cope with that. So, I mean, I would say one way that the, that the Jewish people survived is like massive amounts of creativity, you know, and just far, as far as like how they're understanding themselves as a national, as a people. And like, just holding on to that identity, mm -hmm. like no matter what. Yeah. Whereas, well, think like, about the other cultures, they kind of left it by the wayside, I guess maybe. And this is well, think about you know Native Americans in the U.S. Okay. Right. Would probably be a good yeah. analogy. You have a people who are just completely um, oppressed, thrown <coughs> off the reservations, you know, um, whittled down to the point of you know, you know, hundreds where they used to be thousands, um, and still trying to hold on to an identity and figure out like how to how to continue in that despite not having the link there to a land that in, in Native American kind of thinking was like so crucial to their identity, you know? So I think the Native Americans are a good analogy to the Israelites and that same kind of creativity it takes to like maintain that national identity once you're separated from something that is so crucial to that identity. 